Congresswoman Watson and Congressman Connolly uh, and other members of the committee and subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify at this hearing today. Uh, first, I'd like to assure the public that changing from six to five days is not a done deal. It requires the consideration of both my commission and the Congress, and no decision has yet been made. The Postal Service presented today its litany of problems and worst case scenarios. But what do they propose? In two words, reduce service. Fewer employees to serve the public, fewer plants and fewer retail facilities, and fewer collection boxes. The plan also eliminates Saturday mail delivery, always considered a competitive advantage for the Postal Service. Ultimately, the Postal Service would become a shadow of itself. And those who rely exclusively on the mail, the elderly, the poor, rural America, and those who cannot or will not connect to the Internet may suffer the most. Even more troubling, its plan stops at 2020, with nothing to arrest mail declines after that. On the contrary, the plan will spur more declines, a downward trajectory that further shrinks the system, with mail and this fundamental communications infrastructure dis disappearing in tandem. This vision of the future is not inevitable. Neither the $238 billion deficit nor the double-digit volume declines seem credible to me. Even in the Internet age, mail has a unique power to touch readers and deliver results for senders. It can drive sales, provide privacy, deliver votes, and shape important personal decisions that affect life and country. America's mail system can be reinvented and re-energized for a new century of customers. The Postal Service plan, however, has no growth and little innovation, only straight downward sloping trend lines. In my 12 years on the Commission, I can recall times when the Postal Service predicted billion-dollar losses and ended the year with billion-dollar gains. This year, the Postal Service reports that in, through February indicate that it's $1.2 billion, $1 billion ahead of forecast. Mail volume is down by 8 percent, but standard mail and shipping service volumes are up. And both of these products are sensitive to economic conditions and are positive indicators of the economic turnaround. Given this level of variability in only six months, projections that lie six years or more ahead are simply unreliable. Rather than beginning with a premise that cuts in size and scope are the only way to solve deficit problems, address these first in fundamental questions first. What does the law require? What is best for the nation? How can the Postal Service maintain and improve its universal service obligation? These are the questions that the PAEA requires our commission to ask. GAO and the Postal Service offer recommendations without this context. An axiom in the business community is a company can't cut its way to success. You need something new. And the consensus in the mailing community is that there is not much new in these two reports. The reports should have first looked on how to keep open as many post offices as possible, what new products the public needs that the Postal Service is uniquely positioned to provide, and how to keep delivery at six days, and then how to determine the products and service levels that most that are most advantageous to its future success. The Postal Service efforts to build, to expand customer access through internet use and sales of stamps at supermarkets are commendable. But ask the small towns of America if they think government business should be conducted in Walmarts. Envisioning the future calls for a transformative process, not a capitulation to big box retailing. My testimony, my written testimony, includes many ideas I would have proposed for the Postal Service to accomplish by 2020, and others now being studied by my Commission staff. Among them, develop mail products based on value to the customers, not to rely on volume. This is the fundamental tenet needed to fix the Postal Service's broken business model. Provide a one-stop shop for government services. Participate as a full partner in the nation's census in 2020. Commit to having a network of post offices in key locations open longer hours, even on Sundays, and guarantee at least one 24-7 post office in every city in America. Convert the vehicle fleet, every big city, convert the vehicle fleet to run on electricity, reducing annual fuel and maintenance expenses by more than $400 million. Incremental improvements compound and beget real growth. Nevertheless, I'm not a Pollyanna, 
The Postal Service is facing serious financial difficulties. On, it may run out of cash uh, at the end of this fiscal year. Over the past three years, the Postal Service paid $15 billion or more to the Treasury while borrowing more than $8 billion from the Treasury. Borrowing these payments does not make sense. Only borrowing for investment in the future does. The question of whether the Postal Service has been overcharged by $75 billion for its pension liability will be reviewed by the Commission uh, using an independent actuary. And we plan to issue our report about this this summer. And the Commission is now evaluating the Postal Service's plan for eliminating Saturday mail delivery. In addition to our docketed on-the-record hearing at the Commission, we will hold a half dozen hearings across the nation and have so far received more than 1,500 comments. Our findings and the public record we develop will be available for your consideration within six to nine months. Before Congress agrees to major service cuts, it should resolve the pension and retiree benefit issues. And the Commission should be allowed to complete its analysis of the five-day delivery pro proposal and then present it to you. As the economy rises, it will carry the mail with it. We must use the upswing to change the Postal Service into a vibrant communications network, providing universal service and meeting changing customer needs and demands. That concludes my testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Williams, you're now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for asking for our testimony today. The Postal Service's financial condition is serious. The situation is a product of the economic downturn and the chaos of the digital age that has sent shockwaves through the communications sector of the economy. Further, the Postal Service entered the storm with some chronic problems that had been masked by success in earlier years. Two pathways lie before the Postal Service. The most obvious is a serious financial crisis with temporary patches that will consume the energy for change and will leave mounting debts with little chance of repayment. The other pathway is much more hopeful. The current crisis is an opportunity to migrate toward a lean and successful enterprise that is well positioned for a highly adaptive future and that thrives within the model envisioned by the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act. This pathway will require long-term solutions effectively executed to address a few critically important issues. First, the optimization of the Postal Service's costly network of plants, post offices, and administrative apparatus must be accomplished as rapidly as possible while balancing commitment to service. Since 2003, the Postal Service has streamlined its network by reducing over 130,000 employees and in 2009 alone cutting $6 billion in costs. These are credible actions, but more is needed to match the declining mail volume projected through 2020. Next, the rigid work rules do not match the ebb and flow of mail and customer demand in plants and post offices. As the mail continues to decline, the need for more flexible staff to perform a wider range of duties becomes more evident. Also, the greater use of evaluated letter carrier routes would provide better incentives to allow for more effective management. Thirdly, we and the Postal Service have recognized the need for a simplified pricing structure to replace the over 10,000 prices contained in their 1,700-page customer manual. A simpler pricing structure would be easier to use, encourage new customers, and improve revenue accountability. And finally, this year, Congress directed the Postal Service, OPM, and OMB to develop a fiscally responsible legislative proposal for the Postal Service benefit payments. Our office found three areas where overpayments are occurring. An exaggerated 7% health care inflation forecast instead of the 5% industry standard, resulting in an overpayment of $13.2 billion by 2016. An excessive 100% benefit plan refunding, prefunding requirement compared to OPM's prefunding level of 41% and the SMP 500's 80% rate. Even using the higher 80 percent rate funding, funding goal would result in a $52 billion surplus. Lastly, the Postal Service Fund was overcharged $75 billion so that employees could retire at promised levels. When the Post Office Department became the Postal Service, employees that belonged to the Federal Pension Fund now contributed to the Postal Service. Retirement costs were divided according to the number of years employees had worked for each fund. However, the Federal Pension Fund paid for retirements based on 1971 salaries, not final salaries. 
the Federal Pension Fund collected full contributions but paid only partial benefits. OPM has explained that these missed charges were in response to what they believed to be the will of Congress expressed in 1974. However, the 1974 language was repealed by Congress in 2003 when large overpayments were discovered. At that time, OPM inexplicably had not detected a 41 percent overfunding error in this $190 billion pension fund. Congress directed OPM to use its authority to oversee the reforms using accepted dynamic assumptions to include pay increases and inflation. Fixing the last issue alone would fully fund the pension and health care retiree funds. The Postal Service's $7 billion annual payments would no longer be needed since the plans would be fully funded and interest income could pay the annual premiums. The Postal Service is being bled white with erroneous payments before they open their doors. The $7 billion mischarge accounts for 66 percent of the Postal Service's projected $11 billion loss this year. This is also serious because the Postal Service Fund is not made up of tax dollars. The two funding streams are employees' own money and money collected from postage sales inflated as a result of the mischarge. The mischarges should be backed out and fund balances reset to proper levels to achieve the retirement reforms Congress enacted in 2003. This would give the Postal Service a good chance of adapting to the efficient market forces envisioned in PAEA. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. William, uh, excuse me, Mr. Bill O'Brien, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Lynch, Ranking Mes Member Chaffetz, and members of the committee. I'm pleased to be here today on the behalf of John Barry of the Office of Personnel Management to discuss the U.S. Postal Service's contribution to the Civil Service Retirement System, or SERS. OPM commends Chairman Lynch and the committee's efforts to review retirement obligations and other associated matter related to the financial viability of the Postal Service. In particular, we appreciate the opportunity to explain our position on the recent report by the Postal, Office, Postal Service's Inspector General, which questioned the calculation of postal contributions to the retirement fund. The key question that was raised by that report is whether the allocation of costs between the Treasury and the Postal Service to fund postal retirees with service to the Post Office Department prior to the establishment of the Postal Service in 1971 is fair. That is an issue about which is open to debate. The primary concern of OPM is that the trust funds necessary to provide those benefits are properly funded. And it is important to remember that the level of funding to provide benefits to postal retirees is not in dispute. The postal, the postal IG's report suggests a new, different way to allocate costs necessary to fund Postal Service retiree benefits. The allocation formula used by OPM is that which it is directed under current law and is not, and nor should it be characterized as, an overcharge. Furthermore, the allocation methodology is consistent with sound actuarial practice and has been reviewed by outside independent experts. A change to current law could reduce the share of retirement costs allocated to the Postal Service and allow the Postal Service to use the resulting funds for other purposes. But it would be a change to current law and a shift from previous legislation and congressional intent. I'd like to give a brief overview of the events that bring us here today. In 1971, the former Post Office Department was converted to the U.S. Postal Service, an independent entity. Not long after, Congress considered who should be responsible for the increases in retirement obligations for individuals who were employed by the Post Office Department before 1971 that were the results of increases in pay. This resulted in the act enactment of Public Law 93-349 in July of 1974. The law was clear that the Postal Service assumed the obligation to the, re to the retirement fund for increases in pay upon which benefits would be computed. Congress subsequently enacted a number of other laws dealing with other aspects of Postal Service service re funding, including legislation making the Postal Service responsible for funding the cost of living increases, or COLAs, applicable to postal annuities. More than one of these bills included requirements that the Postal Service make payments to fund under schedules set by Congress. During the period from 1974 to, to 2002, it was generally assumed that postal payments required by legislation approximately slightly less than the full funding of the postal CRS obligation. However, this was inaccurate. In 2002, OPM determined that if the Postal Law Service continued to make payments as it had been, its liability would be significantly overfunded. 
to address the issue, OPM sent a legislative proposal to Congress, which was subsequently enacted to convert the funding mechanism to one applicable to the Federal Employees Retirement System, or FERS, which lowered the contributions that were required of the Postal Service. That change did not affect the Postal Service's obligations for cost increases due to increases in pay because Congress understood that the inclusion of those costs was an inherent aspect of retirement funding, which is evident from the committee report. OPM's methodology was considered in a January 2003 GAO report. In that report, the GAO, quote, evaluated the reasonableness of OPM's methodologies for allocating estimated benefit payments and other expenses between service rendered before and after July 1, 1971, the effective date of the Postal Reorganization Act, unquote. In that report, the GAO suggested no major changes to the methodology used by OPM, although it did recommend a consideration for military years of service, a modification that was made in 2006. In 2003, the Postal Service sought a new funding policy that would reduce its ob obligations. Their proposal was that the pre-1971 service be calculated on a basis of a simple years of service approach essentially the same methodology that has been proposed by the Postal Inspector General in its report la this past January. The matter was carefully considered by P OPM and by OPM's Board of Actuaries at that time and declined. The Board of Actuaries concluded that the methodology OPM used was valid and that it followed the intent of the Act. The issue before, that is before Congress before Congress in the past has made changes to postal retiree fundings. We believe it is clear that OPM's actions have been fully consistent with the letter of the law and in accordance with sound actuarial practice. Finally, funding postal retiree benefits as, is a separate matter from the issue of retirement funding. The two subjects are intertwined because the Postal Service wishes to use the savings from a recalculation of retirement obligations to satisfy its obligations to fund retiree health benefits. Such a pro proposal reinforces OPM's testimony. The actions suggested by the IG report, transfer funds to the Postal Service Retiree Health Benefits Fund, are impossible without congressional action. We appreciate the opportunity to appear before you and to explain the basis for calculating <laughs> postal retirement obligations. Uh, please answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. Mr. Kosar, you're now recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Chairman Lynch, Ranking Member Issa, and members of the committee, and the Congressional Research Service thanks you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. The committee and subcommittee requested CRS to submit written testimony that discusses a range of postal reform issues relating to the Postal Service's financial condition. CRS has done this. Here my time will be used to offer some observations on the Postal Service's short-term and long-term financial challenges. These observations are drawn largely from the concluding section of my written testimony. The short term. In the short term, the Postal Service may face a liquidity problem, possibly as early as this autumn. At the end of the first quarter of FY 2010, the Postal Service had $0.8 billion in cash, which is a low level for an agency with an average weekly operating expense of over $1 billion. Unless the Postal Service runs a profit over the remainder of FY 2010, it will have to borrow money to continue operations. By borrowing from the Federal Financing Bank, the Postal Service can back bolster its cash in hand to about $6.5 billion. $6.5 billion, however, may not be enough to get the Postal Service through the autumn. The agency must pay $5.5 billion into the Retiree Health Benefits Fund on September 30th, and it must pay $1.1 billion to the Department of Labor for workers' compensation in October. This amounts to $6.6 .6 billion and doesn't exclude any other costs that may come up. Congress may wish to ask the Postal Service to provide it with a timeline that clarifies just how long the agency can, can continue operations absent legislative action. This would help address any public concerns about the possibility of a Postal Service shutdown occurring in November when election ballots are being mailed, or in December when retailers are shipping billions of dollars of goods through the mail. The long term. While the Postal Service's short-term financial condition is clearly problematic, its long-term financial condition is less obvious. In its report, Ensuring a Viable Postal Service for America, the Postal Service described its plight as a rapidly worsening crisis. The report projects a cumulative debt of $238 billion by FY 2020. It is important to understand the nature of this $238 billion figure. It is not a prediction of what will happen. Rather, it is a projection, an estimate of what could happen if certain assumptions hold. These assumptions are not certitude. 
First, postal law caps the Postal Service's total debt at $15 billion. In order for the Postal Service to reach $230 billion in debt, Congress would need to abolish this statutory debt limit and then do nothing for 10 years. This seems improbable. Second, this $238 billion figure assumes the Postal Service will do nothing to reduce its own expenses. This seems unlikely as the Postal Service and PMG Potter today has stated that it intends to use its existing authorities to reduce costs by $123 billion. Third, the report's 2020 projection heavily rests on the assumption that mail volume will fall steadily. This assumption appears to be based upon a single study by the Boston Consulting Group, which contends that the rise of the Internet has created a, quote, fundamental and permanent change in mail use by households and businesses, end quote. This forecast about the future demand for hard copy mail is striking. As the figures on page 12 of my written testimony indicate, since 1930, mail volumes have grown steadily. The consultant's forecast declares that this long-lasting trend has ended permanently. Now, this projected 2020 scenario may be questioned on at least two grounds. First, the use of email in the Internet has been growing since the mid-1990s. Yet, between FY 1995 and FY 2006, mail volume went up significantly. So, thus far, it does not appear that when the demand for electronic communications goes up, the demand for all forms of hard copy mail must go down. Second, and relatedly, the recent drop in mail volume began about four months after the U.S. economy had officially entered a deep recession. So it seems at least plausible that the economic downturn, not the Internet, was the more significant factor in instigating the recent sudden mail volume declines of the past two years. And if that is the case, then the Postal Service's mail volumes, and hence its revenues, might rise again as the economy improves. So Congress may wish to study further the recent decline in mail volume to better determine whether this is a temporary change or, as the Postal Service contends, a permanent one. I thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Kosar. I actually want to thank all of the witnesses. Uh, this is a very uh, impressive and uh, a credible group, very competent group of witnesses, and uh, I appreciate your willingness to come before the committee and help us with our work. Uh, let's get right to it. Uh, I'll yield myself five minutes. How do we resolve this difference between uh, OPM and, uh, and the Postal Service regarding what is owed here? Uh, I, I mean, I, I understand it from a, a basic point of view that there should be some type of equity in, uh, in divided service, uh, that the Postal Service should not be asked to pay more than its share in, a, in, a, in an employee who had divided service between the old department and the new. There seems to be a basic sense of fairness in that, and I think that was more or less Congress's intent, speaking quite oversimplified. Uh, how do we resolve this difference? Uh, it's a huge number, $75 billion. Uh, and uh, it's made much more uh, important given the urgency of the Postal Service's situation right now. Mr. Williams, how do you think we should resolve this? Congress directed that OPM and OMB and the Postal Service go into a room and try to decide and try to resolve the, dish, the differences. And it could be that there are a number of solutions to this. Uh, the simplest, the, the easiest would be to uh, reset the, the two funds. There are, there are other alternatives. The emergency arises from the $7 billion annual payment. I think that that needs to be dealt with first. And then I think the funds can be reset in a way that, that doesn't devastate the federal fund, which would be a bad thing, but that that recognizes that the postal employees and the, the mailers have paid in enough. The funds are fully funded and it's time to stop putting money into them. The, the same thing happened back in 2002 when we realized there was a mistake and we were about to overfund by $78 billion. As soon as that payment disappeared, OPM showed up and tried to introduce a new bill for us to pay military 
pension. So obviously we don't have a military and the government is already financing its military. I, I think a, the first thing to do is to remove the emergency and stop the bleeding and then sort out in, in the fullness of time which of the solutions before us is the right solution. Mr. O'Brien. Just to comment, I mean, one of the difficulties in this issue is, is that we tend to move between two funds. The CRS, the funding, the, um, the funding for the retiree, ben retiree benefits, not your health benefits, for your retiree benefits, is essentially fully funded right now. That is not in question. The $7 billion payment to the fund that is referred to is actually the, the payments to the retiree health benefits, um, which is they are separate issues and it's really easy to conflate the two. So part of it is those $7 billion payments are in the law, uh, 5 billion of there are. Last year, OPM with Congress reduced those payments from roughly 5 billion to about 1.5 billion. And those two issues continue on. The challenge again with the retiree benefits as we do this is simply changing the scope of the retiree and saying we're gonna fund those less. This kicks us down the can a bit. One of the complicated parts from our end is that these are not sort of standalone issues. The implications of the decisions you make regarding how we fund the retiree service will affect how you fund the retiree health benefits, which have larger budgetary implications. If I might just add that there, there is an opportunity to look solely at the health care retiree benefit fund issue and look at how to uh, recalculate what that total payment should be. Should it be the 75 percent approximately of, of estimated uh, liability? Is the liability the right amount? And what should the payments be over a period of years? And, uh, and I believe that uh, it certainly is possible to come up with a very credible arrangement to uh, significantly reduce the payments that the Postal Service is obligated to make on a yearly basis by looking solely at the decisions around that health care retiree benefit fund, reducing the liability, and spreading out the payments. I, I think that that's an alternative as well that needs to be considered. Thank you. Mr. Kosar, I don't assume you have a horse in this race, but. Uh... Absolutely not. No horse within this race. Um, I'm not an expert on pensions, and so I won't try to offer any. Sort have you of looked at this for CRS, though? Have you looked yes, at this? Yes, I provided an overview in my report on it. And I what do you think? Um, I don't recall any accusation of. OPM's current approach as being against the law, and in which case, if it's not against the law, then it's an equity question, or an equity question inevitably is going to involve lots of calculations that inevitably I think are probably going to be political. Namely, you'll have to go to the judgment of Congress to see what it thinks fair. I think a key point is that, as best I can tell, this is a zero-sum game. Uh, if the Postal Service is allowed to, say, claw back some of that $75 billion, then somebody else has spent four years in Finland. I'll just comment that, that this uh, experiment that the Finns are doing is in one of what they call their big cities, which is about 200 people. It's a, it's a small experiment that they're trying uh, on this product, but the Finns are way ahead in terms of technology, and it certainly may catch on there. Um, I was uh, speaking with the head of uh, Deutsche Post yesterday, and, and they still provide six-day delivery. And um, what they were uh, uh, valuing most about their mail was the privacy of the mail. Uh, email does not provide What's privacy. What's the cost for a It's, it's 80 cents. 80 they, cents. They, yeah. they pay 80 cents. And, uh, and it's a smaller country. The delivery costs are, are less. I'm sure that they're making more profit on, on their mail than, than we do. Um, they haven't had uh, billing in their mail for 20 years, so, so the declines they've had are much smaller, the, the European declines. It, every, every country is quite different. But what struck me was uh, his argument that uh, the letter carried against inspection uh, is of such value in a country that's experienced uh, the political regimes that they had in the 20th century, the Nazis and then the, then the uh, Eastern Germany uh, regimes. And, and you cannot have a system, at least not yet, and it doesn't look likely, uh, and an email system where person to person you have the same privacy. You, we now have systems where you can bank with fairly good security systems. There are walls and protections, but person to person correspondence is simply 
very risky on the Internet. Uh, so I think there are uh, still great values for the mail we have. And in my testimony, uh, the first thing that I suggest that the Postal Service do, I certainly don't want them to stand still, is to change the focus from volume to value. And if they create a series of products uh, that are of great value to people in the mail, uh, they're more likely to get the high margins they need uh, to keep the mail system and the other services that are part of the universal service available to people. Yeah, I, I understand oh, and, what and you're saying. And by the way, in regard to just, European you comparisons, me, we, we're, me, uh, we're intimately involved with me, those. Will you just let me speak? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I was going to answer. The person, the person mail, though, is, uh, is microscopic in the current mail system. People well, sending letters to each other, it's, it's really a microscopic it's, part it's, of the... It's, uh, it's about 5 to 6 percent of the mail, and the, when you consider what the potential is for growth in small businesses, which are quite comparable in terms of the transactions that are happening, and everyone agrees that there's a great deal of growth potential I think in small business businesses. has remittances and, 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 no, and no, commercial uh, activity. The, think of all the people who are setting up businesses in their homes, and in addition to the electronic communications that they have there, there's there's personal correspondence, individual pieces of well, material. I know. Yeah. So there's, there, Businesses there, can be located in the home. That's still a business, though. That's still you know a business. I mean? it's, it's, and, it's just and, a different driver than, and it than social and can, interaction. Yeah, and it can create volume, but I think it would be volume if the Postal Service is, uh, focuses it right. That's volume that's of high enough value that you can uh, charge more for it and keep your margins up so you don't have to rely on advertising mail. Okay. My time has expired. All right. As I understand, we're about to have votes. Uh, I want to thank you all for your willingness to come before this committee and help us with our work. Uh, we, I'm sure we, we're going to have more hearings on this and more discussions. And uh, thank you for your cooperation and your assistance. Have a good day. Thank you.